There we go. Thank you, Professor Duan, for that kind introduction. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, thanks for the invitation. While I'm getting things a little situated here, I'll let you know that the standard disclaimer applies that I am speaking today in my own capacity, not uh, sharing the views of the US government or the International Trade Commission, which is my employer. First, I think it's fitting that we have spirited discussions about the role that the ITC plays in re resolving trade disputes and in protecting the intellectual property of industries in the United States. The International Trade Commission is an innovative forum, and we're proud of that. We don't shy away from thinking about better and more effective ways to carry out the mandate that has been set for us by Congress. But the ITC is not a policymaking body. In fact, we were set up in 1916 specifically to avoid that. We are a bipartisan commission with no more than three members of the commission from a single party at the same time. And when we were set up, we were set up to be a group of technicians that would gather the best data possible and make the most reasoned decisions possible free from political influence. We execute laws passed by the Congress of the United States as members of the executive branch. Thus, it's not my role as a judge to determine whether the policies that have been enacted into law are the best policies or whether they could be improved. The contribution I can make to today's conversation is to describe the operations of the commission from my unique perspective. At this point, I've been the presiding judge and fact finder in scores of investigations alleging infringement of United States intellectual property or misappropriation of US trade secrets. But that's not the only job I've held at the ITC. I've served as an attorney advisor to administrative law judges, and I've served in the office of the general counsel as an attorney where my client was the commission itself. I've argued cases at the federal circuit defending actions taken by the commission I've also served on a detail as a personal advisor to commissioners who vote on final actions in Section 337 matters. I was a law clerk at the Federal Circuit, which sits in review of commission decisions. I've sat in interagency meetings during the presidential review period of an ITC action. And there, in those meetings, I've heard the views of many different government agencies on intellectual property enforcement at the ITC. I've sat in meetings with the, in the Office of the Solicitor General of the United States when topics of intellectual property enforcement have come before the Supreme Court. And I've served on a detail to the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Why do I tell you all this? It's because I want you to know I have firsthand experience in hearing diverse views on every aspect of the ITC's mandate to conduct investigations under Section 337 of the Tariff Act of 1930. These experiences have allowed me to witness the difference that the ITC makes in intellectual property enforcement and in protection of the industries in the United States. I try to be mindful of the privilege that has brought me to this point in my career and of the privilege that it is to serve in my current role. I'm lucky that when I go to work each day, I know what I'm doing is something that will make a difference to real American workers. In any case where I recommend an exclusion order, it's because the evidence shows that there is an industry here in the United States that is actively exploiting the intellectual property at issue. In the vast majority of those cases, I see evidence quantifying the number of US jobs directly tied to the intellectual property at issue. 
I also see evidence that these are good paying jobs. Evidence that the benefit, evidence of the benefit to the US labor market and evidence that that benefit is substantial. The ITC does not issue relief where there is not a significant or substantial domestic industry. I'd like to talk for a minute about the expertise of the ITC. That's probably just best down there because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pushed off again. Thank you, Professor. I'll just sit right here. The ITC is a unique adjudication body in the United States and particularly unique for the adjudication of patent infringement. If you go to trial on patent infringement in the United States, there's about a one in five chance that your trial occurs at the ITC. This is because district court hold fewer trials and the ITC holds trial in the vast majority of the cases that are instituted. So our six judges have a lot of experience trying intellectual property cases. I'd like to tell you about those six judges because they are the best judges in the country doing this kind of work. First, we have Judge McNamara, our senior most judge at the ITC. She's presided over more than 85 intellectual property investigations. That's all she does. Judge Elliott has a degree in physics from Yale and his law degree from Harvard. Judge Bhattacharya is the opposite. She has a law degree from Yale and a biochemistry degree, magna cum laude, from Harvard Radcliffe. She also served as a member of the Office of Unfair Import Investigations for over a decade, litigating patent cases day in and day out in front of the ITC. Then we have Judge Moore, another former member of the Office of Unfair Import Investigations. His degree is in electrical engineering from Stanford and his law degree is from Georgetown. Not only does he have ITC expertise, but he was a judge at the patent office for more than a decade before coming to us as a judge. And then there's Judge Johnson Hines, our newest addition to the bench. She's a, an electrical engineer from RPI. She was a law clerk to Giles Rich. And she had a distinguished career in private practice representing clients on both sides of the V in front of the ITC and in district court. There is not another adjudicative body like this in the world in terms of trial experience with patent infringement. When judges issue their decisions, they're advised by attorney advisors. Each of our judges has two attorney advisors that also have engineering and law degrees. They are presented with evidence on the record from the Office of Unfair Import Investigations. All of those attorneys employed by the commission have engineering degrees and law degrees. The decision of the judge is reviewed by the Office of the General Counsel, all of the attorneys there engineering degrees, law degrees, IP expertise. They make recommendations to the commission and each of the commissioners has a special counselor with expertise in intellectual property, advising them on the final disposition of the investigation. By the time the investigation decision is issued by the commission, it's been examined by more than a dozen attorneys who have full-time expertise in intellectual property matters. There is no other adjudicative tribunal like this in the world. That expertise leads to predictable results. You don't want to be, you don't want to invite the ITC to your cocktail party because they will be the most predictable in the room. It'll just be boring. You'll know exactly what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. We run on schedules that are announced in the first weeks of the case. So we tell you the day you're going to get your decision. We tell you the day that your briefs are due. And we try very hard to stick to those dates. We're fast. We go to trial in nine months on average. 
whereas district courts go to trial in three years on average. So we're a predictable, fast forum with deep expertise. Who doesn't want a decision from a forum like that? I'll tell you who, infringers. They don't want a thorough examination of the record by a tribunal that has deep expertise. They don't want a decision that will be explained in such detail that any problem with the decision can be pointed out through multiple levels of review. There's no black box jury at the ITC. All of the deference that we get in any uh, judicial review comes from the strength of our reasoning. That's even more true today after the recent uh, Supreme Court term than it's ever been. So uh, when we think about what the ITC is doing, uh, we're providing fast decisions with deep expertise in a transparent way. There are, of course, ways that we can do better. I'm sure we're going to hear about those today. But it's also important to, to keep in mind some of the other features inherent to the commission's structure that result in this effective decision making. One of these features is that uh, we have something called the domestic industry requirement. Now, in the national dialogue about patent enforcement, there's a lot of discussion about non-practicing entities or patent trolls. There is no tribunal that is better organized to prevent abuse from a non-practicing entity than the ITC, because Congress assigned us the duty to ensure that there is a domestic industry exploiting the intellectual property before we grant relief. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what the, the evidence shows about our um, performance in adjudication and uh, the claim of foreign bias. I speak a lot to um, judges around the world and they want to know uh, what influence I am subject to when I render a decision at the ITC. And it is my pride to tell them that I am granted complete independence in rendering any decision in my adjudication. Uh, the commission is prohibited by the Administrative Procedure Act from instructing ALJs in how to render their decisions. Uh, the statistics show that there is no respondent or complainant bias at the ITC. Uh, it is true that complainants prevail more often at the ITC than plaintiffs prevail in district court. But that is because of a selection bias. In order to have a complaint instituted at the ITC, you're going to have to show every single element of a violation of Section 337 uh, has, has a basis for finding that it's been met. This means our complaints are about 100 pages long or more with sometimes thousands of pages of exhibits. In contrast, in district court, we have notice pleading. You can file a district court complaint that says, I, I think you're infringing my patent without any uh, supporting documentation. We have claim charts that show where every element of the claim is met in the complaint. So when the ITC institutes a complaint, it's based on a much higher likelihood of showing violation than the average district court case. Now, there's also been expressed some concern about whether the ITC is uh, not serving its purpose of protecting domestic industries, whether it's too involved in 
doing other kinds of adjudication. In 2023, only 18% of our investigations were brought by solely foreign complainants. Now, what do I mean by that? It's important to know definitions. That means that the service address that the complainant provided in their complaint is in a foreign country. But even of those 18%, all of those complaints showed, or alleged rather, that the complainant had a significant or substantial domestic industry in the United States. That meant that they were employing people in the US or expending capital in the US, uh, stimulating the US economy through research and development or licensing of intellectual property. The remainder of those investigations all had US complainants, US corporations. Now, when we think about US and foreign corporations in 2024, it's, it's, it's almost inaccurate shorthand. What do you call a corporation that employs thousands of engineers in Silicon Valley, but also deploys billions of dollars to make products in China? What do you call a corporation that has thousands of engineers employed in Korea but has deployed billions of dollars in the United States in highly sophisticated manufacturing. What is the, what is the domestic corporation? Well, thankfully, Congress has set down for us at the ITC how we determine what a domestic industry is. It doesn't have anything to do with the place where the corporation is registered. It has everything to do with U.S. jobs and money in the U.S. economy. Because at the end of the day, we're a trade organization and we regulate trade. So we're concerned about U.S. investment and our decisions focus on that. Um, In 2023, by the way, there were no, no investigations at all that were foreign complainant, foreign respondent. Didn't happen at all. And there are lots of other statistics. That's one thing that I love about the ITC. It's very transparent. You can go on our website. You can delve into statistics for 30 years and see how the cases shake out, see about settlement rates, see about uh, winners and losers. You can look at our IDS database. This is a new database within the last five years that allows you to search for different kinds of causes of action um, and information related to the uh, parties bringing those actions. So there's, there's plenty of data. Uh, we're very transparent about it and um, we're proud of that. And that's probably a good place for me to wrap up is just to say uh, how proud I am of the work that the ITC is doing to uh, protect U.S. intellectual property, to protect those jobs that I see in my records of cases every day. Um, I am looking forward to a conversation about ways that we can do a better job of that. And again, thank you for having me today. change here. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Judge Cheney, for uh, for those remarks. And uh, lest anybody think otherwise, I have the uh, nothing but the deepest respect for the, uh, the International Trade Commission as an institution, its commissioners, its administrative law judges, and its staff. And just to um, tie into the last point that you made, I, I also compliment the ITC for the really amazing level of transparency and data that's made available to um, to researchers and and to the public, and that's extremely helpful for academics, especially. And it is definitely not the case 
with um, with most agencies. So thank you uh, very much for that. So, you know, the International Trade Commission uh, has been with us for over a century, as Judge Cheney noted, and it, this agency has been on a strange journey over that last century. It was created in 1916 to advise the president on tariff rates. Um, and today, at least the aspect of it that we're talking about is as a tribunal for patent infringement litigation under section 337. About a third of the ITC's work, at least according to its um, budget requests, involves 337 investigations. And the vast majority of 337 cases involve patent assertions. I mean, sometimes they're coupled with trade secret copyright and trademark um, claim, but there are very few standalone non-patent cases. In the last couple of years, I think there were two. Um, I, I could be wrong about that. It, it's clear also that the ITC is very popular as a venue for patent uh, litigation and assertion. And the reasons for that popularity are well understood. It is fast. Um, the, the docket is well organized and it's speedy. Uh, which I again commend the uh, the commission for. Um, I mean, one one thing just to be fair to the district courts, the district courts are not that slow when it comes to preliminary injunction resolutions. I looked at um, some data recently, and for district court patent litigation, uh, median time to resolution for preliminary injunction um, cases it's only fifty four days when the PI is denied. 194 days, about a little over half a year, when the PI is granted. So not, not too slow. Um, nevertheless, um, the expertise of the staff and judges cannot be denied. I, I think we all understand that that's true. And uh, whether it's selection bias or, or not, um, the uh, ITC is a favorable jurisdiction, uh, empirically speaking, for patent asserters. So, so what's wrong here? Uh, so I and uh, other academics looking at this over the last 20 years um, don't have a fundamental problem with how the ITC is executing its statutory uh, function, but just that it seems like it's a bit duplicative of another institution that we have in the United States that does patent litigation, which is the district courts. When the ITC was created and as its patent jurisdiction expanded over the years, it, it did so because there were gaps in the law and the Patent Act in terms of what uh, cases uh, district courts could hear. Things like infringement by imported articles that were made overseas by processes that might infringe US patents. That originally um, was not covered by the Patent Act. It took a, quite a while um, before 271G uh, was enacted to cover that gap. But that and the other gaps that existed in the past have now largely been filled by the Patent Act. So there's not really a statutory need for another body in addition to the district courts to, um, to hear those cases. Um, and so we do get parallel litigation in many cases. Um, you know, uh, according to uh, the statistics that I've reviewed, um, if you look at the ITC cases brought over the last two years, 2022 and 2023, only 6% of them involve entirely foreign respondents who have no US connection. The other 94% are largely cases that at least have one respondent who can be hailed before a district court in the US. Um, and supporting that, 83% of these ITC cases do have a parallel district court case going on um, in either one or more than one uh, district courts. Now, it is true also that district court proceedings may be stayed uh, pending the resolution of an ITC a matter that covers the same, uh, the same subject matter, but not all are. Um, due to slight differences in the patents asserted, even within the same patent family, slightly different corporate respondents. But even when the district court action is stayed, um, those issues that are resolved by the ITC can be litigated, litigated again afterwards in court um, if no exclusion order is granted by the ITC. So we have a situation where the same issues are being litigated twice, if not more times, without issue preclusion, um, the uh, determinations of the ITC on things like validity, uh, which often come first, are not granted um, preclusive effect in the district courts. And you might think, well, this isn't a terrible thing, except it does cost money to have two parallel systems running at the same time. The cost of the ITC's 337 function, according to its budget uh, request to Congress, is about $40 million 
um, per year. Uh, that's just the cost of the institution. The litigants uh, pay tens of millions of dollars collectively um, to litigate both in the ITC and the district court uh, simultaneously. So that's the duplication aspect. There's also a question of inconsistency uh, between the outcomes at the ITC and the district courts. And again, some may say this is a feature, not a bug. Um, but uh, you know, to me, looking at it from the outside, it seems problematic. I think we've all heard a lot about eBay. The ITC is not a court; it's an Article One uh, commission, so it does not it's not bound to follow judicial precedent. And so, there's no uh, eBay analysis in the remedial stage, no balancing test, and so forth. There's no consideration of whether monetary damages or monetary remedies are uh, uh, sufficient to uh, redress. Uh, the uh, the injury to a patent holder because the ITC does not award monetary remedies. All of that makes sense within the context of the ITC's governing statute, um, but it does create inconsistency uh, for parties um, as between their ITC actions and their district court actions. There's also less consideration of complex product issues that are covered by multiple patents, something like the iPhone that's reputedly covered by, you know, quarter of a million to half a million patents, um, it technically can be the subject of an exclusion order uh, by infringing only one patent. There's not a balancing uh, of the equities as you would have in um, a factor three under the eBay test. The ITC does have a public interest test of its own that is different than the, uh, uh, the eBay fourth factor. Um, nevertheless, that public interest uh, factor is seldom um, uh, recognized as significant enough at the ITC to overcome an exclusion order, um, which is again different from uh, what happens in district court. And there are other areas of divergence that are more technical that the, the, the paper that uh, Charles mentioned at the beginning um, covers those. But the third area where ITC patent jurisdiction creates problems is, is what I would call a subversion of its original trade purpose. Um, you know, as, as Judge Cheney mentioned, there are foreign entities that avail themselves of the ITC's remedies. Um, a forum that is supposed to be protecting the US market from unfair foreign imports. Of course, uh, these entities bring these ITC actions through the creation of a US subsidiary, but of course that costs almost nothing um, and it's quite easy to do. So according to my count, um, in the last two years, 31% of ITC patent actions involved claims by foreign manufacturers against US companies who were importing their own products back into the US um, after having manufacture or assembly done overseas. And uh, back in 2013, over a decade ago, I called that a topsy-turvy situation and I, I don't think I've changed my mind um, since then. Um, Judge Cheney mentioned that 18% of, of cases are brought solely by foreign complainants. I, I haven't um, checked that particular uh, uh, statistic, um, but I, I believe it. But honestly, I think it should be zero. It, it seems like an entity that is intended to protect the U.S. market from unfair foreign imports should have no complaints brought solely by foreign complainants against U.S. entities. Um, and I do also recognize that we live in global markets, uh, the world is flat and so forth. If there's no longer a real distinction between US and foreign companies, then why do we need um, an agency that's supposed to protect US markets from these unfair imports? We already have district courts that hear disputes between any entities uh, with disputes in the US. In addition to the foreign entities taking advantage of the ITC, the ITC also has, has mostly become a forum for domestic producers to fight with each other. Um, Silicon Valley companies just bring actions against each other, actions that they are also bringing in district court in the US. The ITC is just a second or third venue where they can fight the same battle, get a second bite at the apple and hopefully win in a different jurisdiction. The Massimo versus Apple case, it's gotten a lot of publicity around the Apple watches um, late last year is a primary example. These are two California companies. They're litigating in district court, and I believe in California and Delaware. 
ITC is just a third jurisdiction where they can beat on each other at the expense of the taxpayers and at the expense of increased prices for consumers. It's not protecting US markets from unfair foreign imports um, to block the importation of products that are being sold by major US companies. Um, I won't talk much about patent assertion entities in the domestic industry requirement. Um, I, I do think there is some question as to whether the framers of the ITC statute intended uh, that domestic industry, when we're talking about the context of manufacturing in US markets, would include something like uh, patent assertion and licensing um, as a business. Uh, that's something that, um, again, I, I know numerous people have, uh, have complained about. And so the final issue that I'll, I'll point out here is, is what I call patent exceptionalism. Even without all of the issues that I mentioned uh, earlier, it's just not clear to me as an outside observer why IP asserters should have the benefit of this additional forum. No matter how good or qualified or fast it is, this is unique. Um, no other type of litigation has a special extra tribunal in addition to district court. We don't have a special medical malpractice you know, uh, agency that'll hear med mal cases in addition to district courts in tandem with them so that plaintiffs can potentially get a better outcome. Um, we do have specialized tribunals in the United States in areas like tax and bankruptcy, but those are the exclusive venues for that litigation. They're not operating in addition to and in tandem with the district courts hearing those same cases. And honestly, this is what the Patent Act set out to do by giving exclusive jurisdiction over patent cases to the federal courts. We didn't want parallel litigation going on in the state courts and the federal courts for patents. We do have it though now um, with the ITC. The, the uh, patent asserters have gotten used to this benefit, but again, if you, I think if you step back and look at it from first principles, it's not clear why uh, patent asserters or other IP asserters alone should get this huge benefit that other litigants in many other areas um, of the law don't get. So over the last 25 years, numerous um, proposals have been made to reform, contract uh, the ITC's IP jurisdiction. I won't go through them all, um, but they come in a few categories. One is to try to eliminate this jurisdictional overlap um, to, uh, to give district courts the first shot at these cases, limit the ITC only to those cases where it is purely offshore defendants or offshore respondents who have no presence in the US where the US courts would not um, have, uh, have a personal jurisdiction over them. Again, by my count, that's about 6% of the cases and you know that there is a, a logic to that. Um, also to give more race judicata effect uh, to um, ITC um, actions uh, so that at least you eliminate some of the duplication in the district court. There are proposals to tighten the domestic industry requirement, um, as I've mentioned, either under its existing framework or by amending the statute to uh, explicitly um, uh, remove um, the consideration of licensing and assertion as a domestic industry. There are proposals to give greater deference to the public interest consideration at the ITC, either through the existing discretionary authority that the ITC has, through the uh, review by the Office of the President and the US Trade Representative, or um, by um, reversing the presumption, uh, maybe in favor of having a, uh, a public interest as opposed to the opposite. There are many proposals to harmonize the standards for relief, uh, ask the ITC to follow Supreme Court precedent at the remedial stage. It does so uh, with respect to um, interpretation of the Patent Act, so why not uh, the remedies? And then finally, there are proposals around um, adjusting the remedies themselves, either allowing the ITC to uh, issue damages awards, uh, allowing the uh, district courts to issue uh, exclusion orders uh, in, in REM, um, and so forth. And the final thought is, well, just uh, eliminate the ITC's patent jurisdiction altogether. That's what's called the abolition uh, proposal. At the end of the day, it does eliminate a lot of these problems. It saves money for litigants and taxpayers. The 6% of cases that just involve rogue foreign enterprises uh, with unfair imports can be handled by the district courts in cooperation with Customs and Border Protection as they do 
um, uh, generally with trademark and uh, copyright piracy cases. CPP is very effective. They stop 10,000 shipments a year of um, counterfeit uh, trademark and copyrighted goods into the United States without the ITC's intervention. CBP can do that directly under its own CFR um, rule, which would need to be amended uh, to achieve this. So, you know, these reform proposals have been around for two or three decades. <laughs> um, uh, but there's one thing that's recently happened uh, this year that might make it more um, interesting to uh, assess these types of remedies uh, today, which is the Loper Bright case, uh, which Judge Cheney mentioned, um, which limits the interpretive power of administrative agencies um, over statutes and gives some of that power back to the federal courts uh, to interpret statutes such as the Patent Act. Um, this might be an opportune moment then for Congress um, to consider the uh, patent jurisdiction of the ITC in view of some of these issues that have come up over the last couple of decades. So with that, thank you, and I'll turn it over to the panel. Now is this working? Yay, it's working. Um, all right, uh, thank you so much um, for introducing us to the um, to the International Trade Commission, to its activities, um, and to the parameters of this um, of this policy discussion. Um, and now I'm delighted to be joined by a number of esteemed panelists. Um, who practice and think about these issues in great detail. Um, looking forward to what you all, um, how, how you all react to the conversation that we've been having and also what ITC practice has looked like for all of you. So to my immediate right is Keisha Reynolds. Uh, Keisha is a partner and the leader of the ITC Section 337 Investigations Practice at the law firm Paul Hastings. Um, she has represented parties on both sides of investigations in over 50 cases at the commission. Um, she was also previously a senior investigative staff attorney at the Office of Unfair Import Investigations or OUII, um, which I think as we'll um, discuss a little bit, is this component within the ITC uh, that actually acts as a party during these investigations on behalf of the United States. So it's a very interesting sort of arrangement. Um, and so, um, and in addition to that, um, she's a registered patent attorney and practices before the PTAP. Um, that fact is going to be important in a second. Um, so Matthew Batten on my left is principal legal counsel at Samsung Electronics. Uh, he coordinates Samsung's ITC docket there. He was previously a partner at the firm Steptoe and Johnson. Um, his practice also focused on 337 investigations. He was also a senior investigative staff attorney at OUII, and he is also a registered patent attorney. Um, <laughs> um, on my far right is uh, Joshua Landau. He is senior counsel for innovation policy at the Computer and Communications Industry Association. They're a trade association representing communication and technology firms. Um, he was previously a patent attorney at Wilmer Hale. He did both um, prosecution and litigation there. Um, he was unfortunately not at OUII, but <laughs> he is a registered patent attorney, um, as am I, as is the judge. And George, I actually wasn't able to figure out if you were. No, no, sorry. Oh, but you have, you have, you have done the engineering degree, right? So you could take it. I am a degree. <laughs> so almost an entire um, patent attorney panel. I would, um, so delighted to be talking with all of you. Um, and to start off, um, you all work for companies or you have clients um, or member, uh, member companies who have engaged with the ITC um, on a lot of different fronts. And so, you know, we've heard sort of the statistics and we've heard what the, what the law looks like and what some of the policy conversations are, but on the ground, what does practice um, at the ITC look like for you? How does that compare with the district courts? What are sort of the merits and um, comparative advantages of the different forums that we have at issue? Uh, let me just start in this direction. So Matt. 
Uh, sure. Thanks, Professor. Um, and thanks, everyone, for having me. I'll, I'll start out uh, as Mike. I'll just push that. Yeah. Is that better? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'll start out with the same disclaimer that the Chief Judge had. Um, I'm here in my personal capacity, so anything I say is, is only uh, my own opinion, and I'm not speaking on behalf of Samsung. So... Um, the ITC is a very important forum uh, for the for the company. I'm certainly very proud of of the company. Or, sorry, very proud of the ITC. I've devoted a big chunk of my career to the ITC, and I'm um, have I think it's an extremely important forum. These cases, um, almost every one of every time a company is named in an ITC case it gets an extreme amount of attention. Um, they, the only remedy you're facing in, if you are named in an ITC case is an exclusion order, which means your products are not coming into the United States. If, if you don't think that doesn't get the attention at the highest levels, you're sadly mistaken. Uh, so these are, get an extreme amount of attention um, without, without exception. We give them an inordinate, um, amount of resources throughout the company on technical side, on the financial side, on the legal side. That's the biggest part of my job is dealing with just these cases. We're named quite often. We usually have two, three, four cases where we are uh, a named respondent. Occasionally we will bring our own cases at the ITC. We will make use of it. As a complainant, by and large, those are only we only will do that in cases where we have ourselves already been sued. So we do not generally um, use the ITC offensively in the first instance. Something that is maybe less well known or less well understood, um, in addition to cases where we're actually a party, we show up very often. Uh, we get drug in uh, in this domestic industry that we've talked about already quite a bit this afternoon. Um, so parties, com complainants who bring a case at the ITC, one of the ways they can satisfy the domestic industry requirement is to point to their own money, right? I'm, I'm a patentee, I have a patent, I spend money, I have factories, I, I do all sorts of things. That's the traditional way this, this has been done. Another way they can do it is to say, well, I, I license my patent, and so I spend money to license that patent, and my licensing activity could be a domestic industry. That used to be a way that people would try to do it. It's fallen out of favor. I'm not aware, really, of folks using that approach anymore. What is becoming and has become extremely popular is to say, for these non-practicing entities, patent assertion entities, who don't have factories, who don't have employees, but they do own a patent, is to find someone who has taken a license, who will take a license to their patent and point to that licensee and their activities in the United States and rely on that for purposes of domestic industry. And so we are used in that capacity very frequently at the ITC. I think I have six or eight cases I'm dealing with right now. We call that DI by subpoena because generally we find out about it when a complaint is filed, uh, we read the see these complaints and find out that, oh, we've been named as domestic industry by some third party uh, who's filed a complaint that just happens to say, well, Samsung took a license and therefore we're relying on Samsung's expenditures in the US for purposes of domestic industry. That is, um, so we're not a party there. The remedy does not directly benefit us but it is a great expense to us. We, we hire counsel. We have to collect and produce sensitive financial technical information. We have disruption to the business. We've got employees who are, you know, spend time on this. They might be deposed. They might have to testify at the hearing. This happens quite frequently, um, more so to us at least than it does in cases where we're actually a party, are a party to the case. So. That is a big part of our ITC docket. Maybe I'll stop there for now. All right, great, thanks. Keisha? Sure, um, well, first, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for, for having me. And I wanna acknowledge Chief Judge and Professor Tom Contreras. Um, 
So I've been practicing Section 337 for about 20 years. Um, I've seen it grow. I started um, practicing um, as an associate for uh, IP Boutique. I was at Kenyon. And then I went to the ITC and was in the Office of Unfair Import Investigations, and I was staff attorney for five years. It was a really important five years of my life. It was during the cell phone wars. Um, actually, it was the beginning of the cell phone wars. And during that five years, I had five trials as a staff attorney. Um, and so for those of you who may not quite understand what the requirements are of a staff attorney is, you are litigating the entire investigation by yourself on behalf of the public. Um, so you're, you're diving into, well, you don't have to, but certainly um, you end up diving into every aspect of the case and you're serving discovery, you're trying to attend all the depositions. Um, this is just one person. Um, and you're having to read the other party's briefs. And back in this time, judges weren't limiting the briefs to 300 pages for a pre-hearing brief. I remember one case, um, I think it might've been a Tessera case. I did all those Tessera cases. I think the pre-hearing brief was maybe a thousand pages. And then I had 10 days to turn around my pre-hearing brief so that I can inform the judge as to what the staff's position was on these issues. Um, so uh, I, have, I have great respect for the staff uh, and Matt and I were next door neighbors. Uh, his office was right next to mine. Um, and we overlapped for a couple of years, but um, I then, um, went out back into private practice because quite frankly, I was working already 60, 70 hours a week. So um, it was just like, well, I might as well go back out to private practice because the ITC was so busy. Um, but during that time that I was there, I also got to see the evolution of a lot of the ITC's jurisprudence. Um, so what Matt is talking about, what I what we used to call like standing in the shoes of your licensee, that case law was really developed during that time period. Um, and um, a quite, quite the, there are quite a few other aspects of ITC jurisprudence that I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later on, particularly around domestic industry that really started to be developed in that time frame. So um, at Paul Hastings, I lead the practice um, and represent complainants and respondents. I have represented foreign respondents um, and I have represent, I have not represented a foreign complainant. Um, and I would say my practice probably leans a little bit more towards the complainant side. Um, and I think it's a little bit more fun to actually have to put on the case. There's a lots of boxes you have to check as a complainant. ITC is already 3D chest, and on the complainant side, it's just 3D chest times two or three. Um, so uh, I have represented clients in the cellular phone space, um, in the semiconductor space, medical devices, pharmaceuticals. I've also, um, a large part of my practice lately has been not so much patent. Um, it's been more trade secret um, and trademark and other forms of unfair competition. Um, and I, I tend to find the hard cases. I like litigating the really hard cases. Um, so in the, when you think about patent law, there are really four places where you can bring your dispute. ITC, district court, PTAB, or you can arbitrate. Those are the four areas. So now here's a shameless plug for my firm. We have expertise in all four of those areas. Um, but the ITC is the atomic bomb of those four. When a litigant decides to file a complaint on patent infringement in the ITC, you know that you're about to start a war. You start preparing for 
the incoming because you know that there's going to be something coming back at you. But um, there are some aspects of the ITC that make it not really suitable for every patent case. So you've got to think about this, you know, do you want to go slow or do you want to go fast? Sometimes as a patent owner, you might not want to go fast. Um, and then you've got to think too, you, are you ready for the incoming? Can you handle it? Do you have the budget for it? And um, also thinking about, you know, is an exclusion order, is the market what is important to me or am I trying to get money? And the ITC really honestly is probably not the place to go if all you're trying to do is to get money. And that's like trying to get your exclusion order so that you have leverage so that you can try to get licenses. If you're looking for particularly like past damages, you need to go to district court. You know, if you're looking at that you can try to collect 600 million in past damages, then you need to be thinking about district court, not the ITC. So it's not every patent case that is, um, that's gonna be ideal for the ITC. Now, when I am counseling clients, um, respondent or complainant, I try to lay out, you know, here are what we see as the benefits of going to the ITC. And then here are the risks, because I need to know that there, there's some risks going there as well. Um, so as, you, as we've heard, um, and, and Chief Judge did a great job of talking about this, is that you know the ITC is fast, um, and so as a complainant, you might you might need to file that case so that you can get your exclusion order by a particular period of time. So I had a case once um, for a client, and that was really it. It was about market share, and we needed to get the market share back in before the next big selling season which would have been October and getting ready for the Christmas holiday. That was the big thing. So going to district court wasn't gonna help us. We needed to go to the ITC because we had a particular target date that we needed to get that remedy. Um, the ITC's remedy is very powerful. You're not gonna get it anywhere else. Um, and, and I even, even comparing it to district court, if you get an injunctive relief in district court, the ITC's order to CBP is the most powerful way to protect the US market. Um, and the judge also talked about, Chief Judge also talked about this, is that the judges in the ITC are the best of any jurisdiction when it comes to a patent case. Um, and that's the selling point that I, I tell my clients. It's like, listen, We've got a complicated case. We can't put this in front of a jury. We need a really sophisticated judge who knows patent law. Let's go to the ITC. This is an ITC case. Um, another upside for a complainant, you don't get into venue fights. Um, you know, all of these things that you do to delay district court litigation, you know, the venue fight, the motion to dismiss, all this, you don't really get into that in the ITC. And it's because you have the heightened requirements for your complaint. I mean, the pleading requirements are very high in the ITC. There's so much work that goes into filing that complaint. District court, I can put a district court complaint together in you know, a week or so. ITC, it's going to take you the fastest you could probably go is maybe three months. And that's fast. Most of the time, you're working on a complaint for a year before you can get it ready to go to the ITC and then there is a process called draft complaint review process where you can take your draft complaint to the Office of Unfair Import Investigations and get an objective look at that complaint to make sure that you have everything in there to be able to satisfy um, the requirements for institution. And even though they aren't supposed to do that, they really do kind of give you like the um, this complaint sucks, or you need to try again. They will give you their, their feedback on that. So you know, by the time your complaint gets instituted at the ITC, you got a pretty good case. Um, 
So also too, there's a remedy um, at the ITC that you can't get in district court and that's that general exclusion order. So a general exclusion order in the ITC allows you to file a complaint against unrelated entities and also make the case for, and we believe there's a whole lot of other entities out there that we just can't identify, but they need to be stopped too. That general exclusion order is the thing that makes to me, that I sell to my clients is, this is why we wanna go here. Cause we can't get this anywhere else. And when we've got, particularly in the trademark context, um, you've got a lot of these entities out here with all of the counterfeit goods, you know, all these goods coming from China, sold on eBay, AliExpress and Amazon and wherever else. It's hard to stop all of that stuff. You know, that the name changes from one day to the next. Well, the remedy that you need in those instances is that general exclusion order. Um, on the respondent side, when I'm representing a respondent, you know, I'm like, look, let's not worry about this case. Um, we're gonna find a way to win. The speed of this case may actually work to our advantage. So, Sometimes you lay traps for the complainant. Um, sometimes they're good, but you know what? The speed of the ITC is so fast, everybody's gonna make a mistake and you just gotta find that mistake that you can exploit and use to your advantage. Um, I had a recent win for a respondent in the ITC for that very reason. It was, they weren't ready. They didn't do, their, the complainant didn't do the work that they needed to do. They didn't hire the right experts. They filed their case against us. And we did, we knew that they weren't prepared. So we didn't ask for any extensions. We pushed everything. We did everything really aggressively. And, um, and it worked and we won. So there are, a couple of benefits I think that work for, for both complainants and respondents. And that's the fact that, and, and actually Chief Judge also touched on this, the ITC is predictable and consistent. Um, I know we're gonna talk about some potential reform here today, but that is one of the aspects that I truly enjoy about the ITC. I'm pretty confident when I tell my client, this is what I think, it's gonna happen. This is how I think these things are gonna unfold. You know, this is how the judges have ruled. I go back and I look at their orders. I'm like, this is how they ruled on this. Um, this is what we can expect. And most of the time we're right because the ITC does have a great degree of predictability with it. And I'll stop there. Right. Oh, thank you, uh, Josh. So I come at this from a very different perspective than either of my other co-panelists because I wasn't an ITC practitioner in private practice. My closest association was seeing my office neighbor uh, not go home ever because she was always staffed on ITC cases. And it's not like I was going home early. But what I have come into this is as I joined CCIA, as I went into the policy sphere, seeing how much impact IC ITC cases could have on our members in a very negative way generally. Um, I mean, Matt talked about DI by subpoena. I don't think he made it clear that they can't say no. Samsung can't say, no, we, we don't benefit from this. We don't wanna be involved. They are dragged into these cases unwilling and Samsung is not the only one. Others of my members see the same problems. They see NPE cases brought at the ITC. They may not go anywhere, but they still cost money to defend. Um, I was looking while Judge Shani was talking. There's about 50 cases at the ITC each year on average. Some years more, some years less. Each one of those is about 10 million in legal fees on average. You're talking $500 million a year in deadweight loss for a, a jurisdiction that is fundamentally duplicative of the district court in most cases. There are limited circumstances like parties that are not amenable to US district court jurisdiction where the ITC seems to serve a function. But when you have two US companies that have pending district court litigation also at the ITC, it seems unnecessary. 
general exclusion orders are another example. But again, those are really when you're getting at entities that shift forms, that shift identities that are not amenable to district court suit. That's not my members. My members are companies that you're familiar with. They're not going anywhere. They're happy to litigate in district court. What they are not wild about is the threat that a single patent on out of the 250, 500,000, however many it is in a phone these days, could pull their flagship product off the market. Um, and the, the Apple Mossimo decision uh, dispute, very, it came very close to Apple having to pull Apple Watches off the market entirely. They managed to design around it and find a way to sell it without a major feature. But it was close to Apple being forced to withdraw their product from the market. That's a huge le bit of leverage in a settlement negotiation. Even if the ITC can't issue a damages award, I would rather have an exclusion order than damages award almost any day. It's going to be a lot more valuable at the end of the day, even if I'm just interested in money. If I'm interested in market share, then yeah, there's a serious benefit of an exclusion order. But those are the cases where district courts are happiest to issue injunctions already. So again, the question of do we need the ITC's functionality or is it duplicative? I arrive at much the same position as, as Professor Contreras does, that it's questionable whether we need a lot of what the ITC is doing. And I'll also agree with him. Um, the ITC's mission of being a trade court protecting US industry seems to have been subverted over time. It seems to no longer be what the commission's purpose is. And I think some of that is statutory shifting. Um, I believe it was the 1988 reforms that really pushed more towards the ITC doing pure intellectual property disputes. But I don't know that that's a good thing. So my day-to-day -day with the ITC is really looking at it from the policy side and occasionally filing public interest statements. So the ITC does have a public interest process. It talks about what is the impact on the US consumer? What is the impact on the US economy? Will substitute goods be available? They take input from the public on this. And sometimes the public is trade associations like mine saying, here is our view of how this will work out. That's great, except I get eight days and not eight business days, eight calendar days from when the notice of inquiry goes out. So if I'm monitoring a case and I know that this happens, yeah, I can do that in eight days. Most of the time though, I find out about it because one of my members says, hey, you know, this case, um, are you following it? And I say, no, they say, oh, we were hoping you'd put in a public interest statement. Well, when is it due? Tomorrow? That's difficult. So the public interest process is supposed to gather all this input and the ITC's position is that it's also supposed to gather input from the rest of the federal government. Um, Getting any aspect of the federal government to do something in eight days is probably impossible. So it's not getting the input from Department of Justice, from the Health and Human Services that the statute actually says the ITC is obligated to go out and get. I think there are a lot of problems with how the ITC is working in the modern business environment that it no longer serves the function it was designed for and that the function it now serves is duplicative. And that is kind of my day-to-day experience with ITC, which is why much of the time I spend working on ITC policy reforms, like the ones that we'll talk about. All right, great. Uh, thanks, thanks, Josh, and all of you for uh, those those perspectives on just what's going on at the ITC, how is it being used? And, you know, the sense I get um, at this point, you have this agency that has this adjudicatory authority over patents. We know that there are district courts. The district courts have um, power to adjudicate patents. So there's certainly some overlap there. Um, they certainly are taking a lot of the same responsibilities on, and um, we know that there are companies who will litigate both at the same time. At the same time, there are clearly differences. Uh, we've talked about the expertise of the body, and that seems very important. We've talked about um, the, the fast pace um, and the predictable schedules. That's, that's important, too. Uh, we've talked about the fact that this remedy is very powerful in the ITC, which is distinct from what district courts can do at least to some extent. And all of these differences, they may be better for some people and they may be um they 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 may put others at a disadvantage. Um, and so the way I want to turn this discussion at this point is we have this proposal on the table um, at this point of maybe we should try to reduce or possibly even entirely eliminate this duplicativeness. 
for each of you as sort of practitioners in the field or people who work with uh, people who are directly impacted by this, what sorts of effects would those sorts of reforms um, have on the folks that you work with? And what message do you think that that should be sending to policymakers? Um, I'll let any of you take that first if you'd like. So um, I just want to address the duplicative comment first. Um, Maybe I am the only person on this panel who feels this way, but I don't know that it's really that duplicative. So that's the argument I keep hearing. It's like, well, we don't want to litigate in two forms at the same time. Well, you know what? As a respondent, you have a matter of right. As a matter of right, you can you can stay that district court case. Um, and then, you know, I want to see the statistics. I've looked at them for matters that I've been involved in. Um, and that where we needed to go to see like how often has this person gone to district court and then tried to relitigate the same thing all over again. And honestly, what I have seen, it is very low incidence of this happening. Usually the ITC case disposes of the issue or you're only going to district court and you're fighting about damages. Um, so I don't really see this, that it's duplicative um, but, you know, let's assume that, that it is duplicative as, as a patent owner, it seems that you would want to go to the ITC first, Pray that your, uh, you know, your opponent, the respondent, stays the district court case because they don't have to, but pray that they stay it. But I'd say probably in probably close to 95% of the time, it stayed. I don't really know of any cases that are going along in parallel. And then get your great claim construction from the ITC and then go to district court if you are going to litigate this thing again and say, at least judge, here's the judge's uh claim construction order, markman order, we should at least be consistent and follow this. Now, um, the cost of that district court case that follows the ITC, you're not gonna, you know, let's assume $10 million in ITC, you're not gonna spend $10 million in the district court because you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna take all that discovery from the district court, I mean, from the ITC and move it over to the district court. You're gonna take almost every single ruling of merit on the merits from the ITC to the district court. And now you're just trying to convince the district court judge to do the same thing. Um, so I, I don't really know that there's a lot of um, waste and that there is going to be a lot of duplication of efforts. And you're certainly not gonna have the $10 million that was spent in the ITC and now you're gonna spend $10 million in district court. It just, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, yeah, I would tend to agree with with you, Keisha, on that. I, and I guess you can look at it to either of two ways, right? But if if you bring a case in the ITC and, and the patent owner wants to also file that district court case, most of the time the respondent will avail itself of that statutory right, stay the district court case, so nothing really happens there. The ITC case goes forward, and either, you know, the... Uh, Respondent wins in the ITC, and, and the, that sort of is the end of things. A district court typically, I think, doesn't go forward. Or you settle, and it's a it's a peace, peace for all time kind of settlement, and you're not going to go to district court too. Um, so in that case, the ITC resolves all issues, and you don't need the district court. Um, maybe you say, well, you know, the ITC really has too much thumb on the scale, right? This exclusion order hanging over the head of, of the respondent gives that patent owner uh, too much too much uh, of a threat for, for that settlement. But I, I agree on this. I don't think there is a lot of this duplication of the district court handling the same IP as the ITC. What you do see more and more of, it seems, is <clears throat> this, these global campaigns asserting different IP, but between the same parties, <clears throat> excuse me. So you'll have ITC cases, you'll have district court cases, but it's different IP. Uh, those can be in multiple courts. You'll be in Europe, in you know UK, in Germany, in China, 
increasingly in South America now, Brazil and, and Colombia and places like that. So, you know, is it redundant to have the ITC being one more one more court that you can go to? Maybe, but you know, you're already dealing with five or six. So what's one more? So yeah, I should note when I say duplicative, I don't mean that necessarily the case is duplicated. It's a duplication of function. Why do we need the ITC if the district court has fundamentally the same role? If all the evidence is going to go over from the ITC to the district court, why not just take it at district court in the first place? That's the, the duplication that I think uh, Professor Contreras referred to, that some of the concerns with it arise. But the fact that you have this additional pressure is in and of itself uh, a distortion of the patent system. It's not, let's litigate and see who actually infringes. And if the patent is valid at that point, it's who can spend more on litigation. And that is not something we should encourage. Yeah, we had a bit of a discussion about costs, right? And so where do, where do costs sort of play into this whole thing? I mean, patent litigation is expensive no matter where you do it. Um, the ITC, based on the numbers that I've seen, um, I probably don't have the same visibility as either of them, but tends to be more expensive than district court. But that's a, a tends to and based off of survey evidence. So you may have very different perspectives on that and probably more accurate ones. It, it is a little bit more expensive, but also too, um, you know, in district court, you're playing 2D chess and the ITC, you're playing 3D chess and you're playing it on a very compressed schedule. And so you have to have much larger teams. So in district court, you know, I can have a team of four and in the ITC, I'm going to have a team of 10. So it's just, you have to put more bodies on it because of the compressed schedule. But um, the cost I, like I said, I don't think that the cost is really going to be where you are spending, you know, $10 million in the ITC and $10 million in district court. Because there's, there's, you have so many efficiencies that are built in. Um, and so all of the work and everything that was done in ITC is going to go up to district court. Keisha is very expensive in case you didn't want to <laughs> especially so in her firm there. You get what you pay for. Um, you know, one of the differences, it might be worth mentioning that that a few years ago, there's kind of a change in the law. And, you know, in district court now, you you have to basically sue one related group of entities. If you're going to go after a, a company, it's it's just one company per complaint. So cases, you couldn't sue Ford, GM, and Chrysler all in one complaint. You'd have to sue, sue them separately. That is not the case at the ITC. And so, when you hear people talk about the numbers of complaints filed at the ITC and they'll say, oh, well, there's only 50 that were filed last year. Um, it's worth keeping in mind that a number, uh, any number of those complaints and usually a fair number of them might include 20 different or 50 different respondents. And those are different companies, different entities, not all the same ones. So that has a way of sort of multiplying the number of companies that are actually involved in an individual case. Uh, and I just kind of mentioned that because it, can impact cost savings and things. You know, if respondents are able to work as a group collectively, uh, there can be some cost savings. The ITC is a very expensive beast. Um, so we've had mention of a couple of special features of the uh, of the ITC. So ordinarily, when the ITC is um, looking at a patent investigation, it's doing the sorts of normal things that you expect um, in patent litigation. I've, I, I see a couple of my patent students, and I haven't taught the ITC yet, so I figure I'll give a little bit of background. Um, they're doing invalidity. They're doing uh, they're, they're doing an infringement analysis. But then they also have to do these two things. This domestic industry requirement, you've got to ask whether or not the patent donor has some sort of sufficient industry in the United States. We talk about exactly what that means. And then these public interest factors, um, which are supposed to act sort of like a check on the ability of the ITC to issue this very powerful remedy that they have um, of, the, um, of, of the exclusion order. And I think that these two are worth talking about because they're two of the major points of some of the reform bills. Um, so first of all, would any of you like to give a little bit of an explanation of what's going on with them and then also um, sort of comment on some of the, the reform proposals um, relating to these two aspects of the ITC? Um, I'm happy to, to start. Sure. I think Matt gave a pretty good overview of the domestic industry question and some of the issues that have arisen. You know, the sort of core of it is 
what are the direct investments my company makes as a, the complaining company makes in the United States. That I think is pretty well set. Nobody's really worried about that. The other being licensing. And there, I think we've come to the uh, realization conclusion, the approach that pure licensing efforts are not going to be sufficient. It's the DI by subpoena where people still see a concern and where a lot of the uh, efforts to reform domestic industry have come in. One of the simplest just being proposing that for a company to be used as a as evidence of your domestic industry, they have to consent and be willing to join your case. So no more being dragged in if you're just a licensee, you would be able to say, well, I have an actual interest in this case or no, I'm, I'm not that interested and I don't wanna be paying for lawyers to do discovery when I'm not gonna benefit. Um, there's some question about how effective that will be in practice, given that a lot of the time you would probably have in whatever license a provision written in that basically says, I consent to being dragged into the ITC. But at least there you can negotiate about it when you're doing the license. So that maybe is a reform. Uh, I don't know how effective it would be, but it would at least move things towards focus on a true domestic industry that is interested in protecting that industry using that patent. So um, I just want to jump in just a little bit because you raised the point that I that I wanted to, to raise, and that's about the contractual provision um, that seems to get glossed over whenever we're talking about this issue. And these are just my own thoughts. I am not, all of my thoughts I've given are just my own thoughts. I'm not speaking on behalf of any of my clients or my firm. Um, but I've always wondered why uh, companies are looking to Congress to fix a problem that they can fix. All they have to do is include a provision in the license agreement that says that they will not participate in any ITC proceeding. That's it. We don't have this issue. But companies are not willing to do that because they want a cheap license. Um, how about the public interest factors? Sure. So um, we've kind of, I know this come up a couple of times now. So in this, in the governing statute here, 19 USC 1337, that, that lays out exactly what the ITC is supposed to be doing. There are these four factors, right? And they're the public health and welfare, competitive conditions, U.S. consumers, and production of, of um, competitive articles. So what it instructs the ITC to do is to say, before you would issue a remedy, you must look at these factors, do an analysis, and determine if basically you shall issue a remedy unless you determine that one of these factors is such that you 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 know it overcomes that and you shouldn't. So you do get a remedy unless there's these get trumped by one of the factors. Um, and I think it's been 40 years or so since there's been a case that they said, well, one of these factors does indeed overcome the, the presumption that you should get this remedy. Um, so it's been quite some time, but they do in every case discuss the factors and address them. Um, and in, in some cases they will tailor the remedy. There are things the commission has done seemingly uh, more so in recent years in terms of um, perhaps grandfathering in when the exclusion order might take effect or giving some specific carve outs for particular uses or things that can happen and even for medical devices and things of that sort. So they kind of tailor things to try to address public interest type concerns rather than just saying we're stopping it, everything at the border immediately and, and having that happen. Um, I, my understanding and from what I've seen is the concern is that that's really still not just a rote, that is still not a robust enough public interest analysis. Uh, what you see in some of these cases um, would has the potential to affect huge amounts of the U.S. economy. Uh, you know, think of um, we. I think Keisha mentioned this once before, but the someone bring, claims infringement of a you know a windshield wiper blade and tries to exclude the entire car. Or, you know, it's a tiny little bolt and wants to include some massive product or issues of that sort, right? To say, 
yes, technically there might, you might find infringement of a patent in some much bigger product or much more important product. The only remedy is this exclusion order. Does that make a lot of sense? And so people are concerned that the, the analysis that that's currently being done isn't enough. Um, and this bill we've kind of referred to, uh, there is a bill pending in the house um, that would make some changes to section 337. Uh, it would flip the uh, flip the way the, the statute is written as to this point and say, rather than you shall issue a remedy unless you find there's a public interest problem, my understanding is it basically says, uh, you must, in order to issue a remedy, you must find that it is in the public interest to do so. Uh, so that is that is one issue. Uh, I know the, as I said, the commission has been it seems like this issue is coming up more and more in cases. Um, there have been medical device products at issue and, and other types of things where they're, they are seemingly more creative in um, ways that they can address some types of public interest concerns. So uh, it is a work in progress. Josh? I would uh, say that I think your understanding of what the AAI would do is completely correct, that it would invert that uh, presumption. I think the what I would add is that what we've seen with the ITC, and I don't mean this as a like, you're not independent, but that in the background, hearing these criticisms, seeing interest from Congress in Congress about changing the public interest, changing domestic industry, leads the agency to the commission to look at what it's doing and make changes responsive to that, even if there aren't legal changes, even if there aren't statutory changes, that the commission sees that um, political concern and is responsive to it as they should be. Um, all right, and so, so Matt, you also mentioned um, the sort of idea that you might have a patent on a windshield wiper um, blade and then the, the exclusion order goes to the whole car. Um, and that ties into um, some discussion we had um, that um, re regarding this problem of multi-component um, products. There have been also reform proposals suggesting that maybe the ITC should take that into some um, account. And um, just putting that out on the table, what, what sorts of possibilities do you think, uh, what sorts of ramifications would that have? Um, were we to, um, say, change the ITC's jurisdiction in view of this sort of multi-component um, product issue? I think that the economic experts would be very happy if we did that. <laughs> Why? Um, because then we would end up having almost like a damages analysis happening in the ITC where we're trying to assess what's the value of this chip to the laptop or what's the value of this camera lens or this whatever to the cell phone. Um, and I see that as really complicating things. Um, but I, the, the winner for that one is certainly the economic experts. I, you know, here again, it's, it is, the ITC has, a, a one size fits all remedy. Uh, so, you know, creative minds are working at how, how do we, how do you handle this issue in public interest? Uh, there is an old test that it says wasn't really necessary anymore because of some old changes in the law, but that it actually got to this issue of how do you assess, do you or do you not get a, uh, an exclusion order based on a small component of a bigger thing? And, you know, the commission has said, well, if it comes up now, it would come up as a public interest issue. So um, I don't think there's been a commission decision squarely on this yet. But but they, as I've mentioned, they, you know, they are doing more on this and being creative. And so I think, you know, there will come a time when there'll be a case squarely on point that they'll, they'll need to address it. But it has there hasn't been one yet, I don't think. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Matt, is that I think that... Um... I think that would be addressed under the public interest factors. I think addressing it under the public interest factors concerns me because it has been 40 years since that has uh, been used to deny an exclusion order. I know it has been used more recently to uh, cabin them, to shape them. But I think the, the multi-component problem is just fundamental to the ITC's remedy. If you have a small piece of a larger product that is integrated into it, but is perhaps not particularly valuable, 
what is the right outcome? Is it blocking the product or is it letting it in? And I don't think there's a, an easy answer to that question, which is why the district courts have damages awards. Um, maybe the ITC can come to a, a creative way of getting to damages through the, maybe through bonding provisions. But um, I, I think this is an issue that is absolutely going to arise as soon as there's a case where it's squarely on point and invalidity doesn't save them. But then you also have to think about um, the patent, the patentee here. You know, the patent owner has the right to exclude others from using their their IP, and the patent owner also, if they have a domestic industry in the United States, has the right to avail itself of the remedies that Congress has given it through the statute, through Section three three seven, um, to say it's a little bit of infringement. Um, I mean, it's, if it's, it's infringement, it's infringement. And, um, so then I think that it has to go into the whole public interest analysis to think like, is it in the public interest to exclude this product from the U S market, um, when the infringement is of this magnitude perhaps, and that's, I think the way to deal with it in this leave the statute alone. But, but that may bring us back to sort of where we were earlier. Does every patent owner basically have a right to go to the ITC? Yeah. Right. If your if your real remedy is you're entitled to damages, sure, because you do have a patent, you're entitled to something there. But we don't think you're entitled to an injunction or you know, an exclusion order on, on the car for your small valuable invention, you're entitled to damages on that and you can get it in district court. Mm -hmm. Is the ITC really the place for you? But there's no, I'm not sure what the path is to, to, to make that change, but that's, that's sort of an underlying issue. And it's been litigated for quite some time. Yeah. Just no resolution. I would say this might be one of the differences between um, being a lawyer who's practicing in the ITC and being a policy person who's looking at ITC reform, the law is that you get this exclusion order. That doesn't mean that's what the law has to be. And in the district courts, the law is not that you have a right to exclude, it's that you have a right to exclude in accordance with the principles of equity. That's where the eBay test comes from. That right to exclude is limited by statute. It is not some broad-based, I can always exclude you. So having it at the ITC, the way the statute is currently written, maybe, but as we talk about reforming the ITC, that doesn't mean that that's what we have to stick with. Um, all right, so um, super interesting discussion. Um, let me, um, I think we've got enough time to talk about one more issue. Um, all right, so um, we also had some discussion about um, sort of who's going to the ITC. Um, we, you know, there, there's, there are different statistics about um, who's a foreign respondent, who's a foreign complainant, um, but it seems that there's a mix of people. There are some foreign complainants, there are some domestic respondents, there are some case, there are some investigations that are domestic against domestic and all sorts of different combinations. Um, and I, I think you know one of the one of the questions has been raised: um, Is this appropriate? Um, there are obviously the definitional questions um, that that Chief Judge Cheney raised. Um, but is this another area that merits reform or do things seem to be working correctly or do things seem to be working um, in, in a way that's positive for, for the overall system? What do you think? So I've also looked at these numbers and the sort of classical conception of the ITC. This was, I looked at it in 2020. I haven't revisited it since then. Um, I was bored, it was COVID. <laughs> <laughs> So back then there were 57 cases, two of them were cases with US complainants against purely foreign defendants. I, there were four cases by purely foreign complainants against a mix of foreign and domestic respondents. There were twice as many in this completely inverted system, uh, situation rather. So I think that there is definitely a concern that the ITC is no longer um, being used in the way that it maybe ought to have been. So I will uh, propose my favorite reform for the ITC, which is just to provide a right of removal to district court. The entities that are, the ITC was intended to address the ones that you cannot reach in district court, they're not going to be able to file to remove to district court and consent to jurisdiction there. They don't wanna be involved. They don't wanna to consent to jurisdiction. So you'll still be able to address that at the ITC. 
But if you have cases where you have domestic entities suing domestic entities in the ITC, let's just move that to the district courts where they were intended to file that. But, sure. but if we're looking at two domestic entities, you know, domestic complainant, domestic respondent, and the domestic respondent is has significant foreign activities, manufacturing abroad and importing their products, that, and that is hurting the U.S. entity, then that U.S. entity, regardless of where the headquarters is of the respondent, should be able to protect its its industry, its U.S. industry. Um, and should be able to avail itself of the ITC and get the exclusion order that it wants in a super fast amount of time. I'm so I agree with the first half yes. of your statement. <laughs> they should be able to protect themselves. I just don't see why it has to be through the ITC. I, d I don't um, see the distinction because of where the headquarters is of or the service address is of the respondent. So I'm going back here to what Congress formed the ITC for. Back then, the concern that was expressed was, we can't reach these foreign un unfair competitors because they are not amenable to US court jurisdiction. That was the genesis of the ITC's foreign unfair competition function. That rationale falls out the window if we're talking about a US-based respondent that is completely amenable to jurisdiction. seems to me the, the IPC's role and, and purpose is to protect domestic industries. And, and as the chief judge was saying, it, it really does, I think, a good job of focusing and paying a lot of attention on, do you have significant, substantial investments, expenditures in the U.S.? You know, boots on the ground here in the U.S. Are you building factories, employing people? That's what's important. That's what, that's what we're here to do, what, we, what we're here to protect. Um, and so I think as long as the focus stays there, is that what the ITC is accomplishing, actually protecting a domestic industry, um, that that is, you know, the, the global nature of corporations these days, you know, every company has a footprint everywhere, or most companies have a footprint everywhere. And so what your technical headquarters is can just gets messy, and I'm not sure it solves things. If To me, it seems the focus should be protecting true domestic industry. Great. Um, all right, so, um, so you know, fantastic discussion, lots and lots of really interesting thoughts about the different ways forward that people have been talking about. Um, so I think we've got a couple of minutes. I'd like to invite, um, I'd like to invite you from Chi and um, Professor Contreras um, to, provide, to provide any comments um, they have on the discussion we've had so far, and then we can take some questions from the audience. Uh, I don't know. Why don't I just, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I don't, I don't have a heck of a lot to add this. It's, it's always really informative and illuminating to, um, to hear what people who have been doing this in the trenches uh, are, are finding and, and that there are both problems arising like the, um, the issue of the involuntary uh, uh, domestic industry a participant, um, but also uh, solutions that that are uh, out there from a practical standpoint, like the um, the use of the uh, the record from the ITC in this record that cuts down on duplicative costs. So you know, I I uh, thank you. Uh, it certainly has helped me uh, get a better understanding of what's going on in this world. I might have slightly more thoughts. <laughs> Let's first talk about duplication. If there is duplication, why aren't we moving toward the best system? Are we sure it's the best system? It's fastest, it's the most predictable. 
I mean, a predictable system could just be that there's never infringement. That is very predictable. It's probably not the best, right? That is also not what's happening. Sure. So I, I just throw the question out. What is the normative best way for business owners to resolve these disputes? And if there is duplication, why shouldn't we move toward the best way to do it? Can't do it. Because the ITC can't grant damages and it can't hold jury trials. Elaborate on that for me. Well, so jury trial, for a damages suit, there's a jury trial right. That right exists in Article Three courts. The ITC, by statute, can't grant, can only grant exclusion orders or or consent, you know, or, or decrees. And it can't. The, what, one of the reasons it can't do the equitable uh, injunction standard is that it can't weigh damages, and that's one of the factors in the in the court's injunction standard. For the same reason, it can't eliminate the possibility of a follow-on damages case. In I understand, and I understand also, the point. It also, therefore, can't, can't prevent the district court from then reweighing an injunction on, on domestic production. What I have heard today and what matches my experience is that actually the ITC solution resolves the dispute in the vast majority of cases, more than 90% of the cases never proceed to the end of district court adjudication. Yeah, but the question is, how do you move? You, you want to move forward from that, right? How, why are we moving toward a unitary best case solution? I'm just saying that this, uh, this, this system seems to be resolving cases quickly in a way that the parties accept. I think his point is that it is impossible to have the unitary system be the ITC. There might be a reason to say the ITC's mechanism is better and move that into the district courts, which might make sense. But because the ITC can't hold a jury trial constitutionally, it can never deal with damages because those are entitled to a jury trial, absent at least uh, agreement by the parties. Agreement by the parties and consents would provide a, a waiver of the jury trial right and would probably allow damages. This came up in the um, trademark context and during some of the recent reforms that were discussed about whether there could be, and I think also in the copyright context with the Copyright Small Claims Court, um, that's why you cannot haul somebody involuntarily into copyright small claims because it can offer damages. So constitutionally, it required consent for that to happen. Uh, there are definitely aspects of the ITC's process that are desirable and I'm not um, anybody who's heard me talk about district courts is not going to think that I think that they are the best option necessarily, but I think that they are the default option. And to the extent that we talk about um, improvements, I would want to focus on improving district court litigation rather than moving, channeling more disputes to the ITC. If anyone's interested, ACUS, the Administrative Conference of the United States, released a report last year about small claims patent uh, dispute resolution and analyze whether the ITC would be a good venue for doing that, including an analysis of the Seventh Amendment issues. Uh, another uh, uh, j just going through some notes about some things that have have come up today. Uh, there are not domestic industries that are holding companies set up overnight for fifty dollar filing fees. That we've never granted such a domestic industry relief. That is not a domestic industry. That is not a real fear. It doesn't happen. It's not a thing. Um, what about domestic companies fighting against each other? Well, those still involve important trade considerations. The reason that there's a domestic industry or a domestic company suing another domestic company is because of that foreign manufacturing. And that foreign manufacturing has a real impact on US trade and a real impact on domestic industry. And that is in the wheelhouse of the ITC. Uh, we are not a theoretical uh, IP rights enforcer. We're all about trade. The practical aspects of keeping goods and services flowing in the United States and across our borders. So even on, when there is domestic 
versus domestic companies, there's a, an important role for the ITC. Uh, questions about whether Congress ever intended domestic industries based on licensing, that is all over the congressional record. It is, is absolutely clear. It's not even a close question. Um, and all of that history is detailed by the federal circuit in the interdigital decision. Uh, about uh, parallel tribunals, there are many special administrative tribunals in the United States that do the same thing as district courts. I'm gonna go to a conference of federal administrative law judges this week where I will meet with my colleagues at other agencies who have this same issue all the time as the subject of at least two recent Supreme Court cases. Landlord tenant law is a simple example. You can sue your landlord in a specialized court in DC. You can sue them in small claims court. You can sue them in the Superior Court of the District of Columbia. And depending on if they have their uh, operation uh, doing um, property management in Maryland, you can sue them in US District Court. So this is a common feature of the American federal system. Um, if we're also, to the extent that we're concerned about foreign complainants, if we're not focused on the economic data about what's happening on the ground in the United States, then why do we care where that complainant's corporation is headquartered? Is it for some other invidious reason? And I think that's a serious, when we, when we throw around words like foreign and domestic, we need to be mindful of that these words have a history about them. And today's ITC is very careful to make sure that it's treating all litigants fairly. And the United States um, has been accused of not doing so in the past. And we've tried to overcome those perceptions. So why don't we just focus on whether there are economic investments and not worry about the address of the complainant? Um, why not just have district court do what the ITC does because the district court can't do it. The district court can't uh, reach bad actors in foreign countries uh, that we don't know the identity of. It's also the right of every sovereign nation to control the flow of goods across its borders. The ITC is not just an alternative IP forum. We are controlling the borders of the United States in accordance with US uh, economic policy. What about $50 million in dead weight loss or fees that are spent at the ITC? Well, that ignores the fact that in most cases, those fees are vindicated through findings of infringement vast majority of the cases, those fees are vindicated through findings of infringement. This is not just hand-waving that we think that there's infringement, but detailed findings about infringing goods coming across the US border. With respect to public interest statements, there are five opportunities in the course of any ITC investigation to submit public interest statements. It's not one eight-day period, five different opportunities any time up until the very time that the commission issues its decision, you can submit public interest statements. The ITC has tried to be very responsive in, uh, and innovative. I started my remarks today in talking about our, our interest in innovating. And public interest is one of those places where we have innovated. We have changed a lot over the last 10 years when it comes to evaluating the public interest, including by providing these multiple opportunities to submit statements. And now our ALJs are actually having entire days of trial where those days of trial are lengthened from the, the, the normal proceedings to give you time to just present public interest statements and develop that public interest record. The, the, the sad reality is, is that most of these opportunities are not taken advantage of. So most of the time when we, when we give parties these extra opportunities, to present public interest statements, we don't get anything that's useful in rendering the decision. Uh, feedback from other federal agencies. Well, the FDA is in, in frequent dialogue and recently told us not to institute 
uh, certain claims because they thought that was in their wheelhouse. This happened within the last year and we did not institute because we thought it was within their wheelhouse. Uh, costs. Um, it is expensive to litigate the ITC, but it doesn't always have to be. We have pro se complainants and pro se respondents actually go to trial because we have in-house OUII people that help them uh, uh, make sure that their rights are vindicated. And the judges uh, at the ITC also try to uh, look out for the rights of those pro se parties. Uh, what about the problem of the small component? Uh, in the larger uh, item. Well, the small component is only a problem if it actually infringes. And the way that the reason that we haven't had to invoke public interest factors to override the IP owner's right in 40 years is because we've come up with other ways to address it. And the way that we do it most often is to give you time to fix it. Remove, remove the infringing part. And uh, respondents that are savvy <laughs> know that they should present a design around during the course of the investigation, get it blessed so that they can make that change and not disrupt their supply chains. So there are, there are ways and reasons to um, use the public interest factors in a way that keeps commerce flowing. Cause that is, you know, that is our concern. We we're a trade agency and we want to keep goods and services flowing and protect the rights of U.S. domestic industries. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you so much. Those were those were super informative. I think really enriched the, the ongoing conversation we're having. Um, questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, I, I first should identify who I am. Um, I'm an adjunct here at WCL. I was for about 10 years general counsel of the Patent and Trademark Office. And before that, I was deputy general counsel of the ITC uh, in charge of litigation. And I did about, by the time before I became the general counsel, the PTO, I had done 80 federal circuit appeals in patent cases from the ITC. Um, so some of what you're saying is new to me in that it's developments since my time. One of the questions I have is, is the only analogy to district court action? In, in the IP area, trademarks and copyrights, uh, you can get border protection by filing your registration with the Customs Service. Um, but that's, that's not, and so patents is, is, is disfavored vis-a-vis -vis other IP except that you can go to the ITC and more quickly get a similar order that you could get for a trademark or a copyright. Uh, and one of the questions just, and I, I have a few of them, so let me pile them up. The an analogy was, was brought by Professor Contreras between PIs and, and, and uh, ITC trials. There's a temporary exclusion order at the ITC, which would be the closest to filing your, you know, trademark registration with border because and how one question I have is how frequent is that? You probably couldn't get that level of speed from a district court. The second um, observation I have is on the question of the cost of the licensees establishing the domestic industry, apart from their transaction cost. Is that a trade policy issue? I mean, if the point is to preserve a U.S. industry and the U.S. industry is created by virtue of licensing and part of the purposes of patents, at least in the law and economics literature, is to allow there to be value in invention by people who aren't good manufacturers. Isn't licensing what you want to do and the uh, the the economic presence in the United States, what you want to protect. Um, then um, the, the final question point I wanted to make is that on, on the recent medical cases, the ITC was always responsive to medical uh, cases. I mean, that, and, and at a time when the, when the federal circuit was with respect to injunctions as well. 
So that in particular isn't a new de development. So I basically, I guess I have two sort of observations and questions. Uh, thoughts? Yeah, uh, on your on your point about the the value or importance of licensing, uh, this that actually that's a an aspect of the pending reform bill that we didn't touch on. In my view, there's a it's important, you know, what nature the license we're talking about took place. There are certainly patent owners or you know someone that invents something and is a, you know he's working in his garage or she's working in her garage and and, and then licenses it to someone who's going to then develop and, and make this the the prototypical example that's that's great that's a license that we absolutely would want to encourage universities that develop develop in, inventions get patents and then go out to to industry to license those and get that developed <clears throat> the production driven type licenses that that's one aspect of licensing there are also these patent assertion entities, uh, non-practicing entities who acquire patents somehow, it, generally through litigation, or at least in terms of what I'm describing here is, you know, then they'll go out and litigate. They'll come to you and say, well, you already make a product. I think it infringes and you, I'm going to sue you on it. So you end up settling with them. And as part of that settlement, you take a license, but you're not doing anything different after you take the license than you were before. But didn't you just, I mean, Patent assertion enemies seem to me at least to be a, an issue of a market failure. The people who are using the patented invention didn't go out initially and get a license or try to buy the patent. There's a there's a flip side to the patent troll issue, which is the scoff law issue. That may that may well be, right? And then there could be examples on both sides of it, right? This could be a junk patent that someone paid you for just to go away because you offered me a twenty thousand dollar license. And it's cheaper to pay you that than to than to than to try to litigate to prove that it's not valid. Or or there's completely valid and, and wonderful inventions and things that are that are worthwhile and and of that sort. So um then when so when you're looking at De relying on a licensee's expenditures in my, in my example of if you're just talking about I paid you a little bit of money to go away right and I didn't I'm not using your patent anymore I didn't do anything different uh with your patent I'm still you just didn't making learn from the product. patent but you are maybe I did using. maybe I didn't because yep. it, you know maybe, right. right there could be a, on both sides of this and so anyway the in this pending patent reform bill, what one of the changes it makes is it refers to production-driven licensing uh, as, re as a requirement instead of revenue-driven licensing. So I think that's trying to get at this, you know, your patent, you just litigated it because you bought it. No one was using it. You're trying to get some money out of it. It needs to be licensing that leads to the development of new or better different products, which is really what we're trying to incentivize. Again, there are most likely examples that fit both models. So it's not like there's, it's all one or all the other. I'd just add that the uh, distinction that Matt's making between ex ante and ex post licensing really reflects the goals of the Patent Act. We don't have patents just to have patents. They aren't created just for fun. They are created to promote the progress of science. If we don't need a patent to get that progress, we actually would prefer not to have a patent on it. That is a better, uh, in terms of social utility, in terms of economic welfare, because everyone can use that. But it's data. never been the standard of the Patent Act. It's never been the standard in what sense? It's never been the standard that an invention had to improve something. Right. But the patent system as a whole is only justified by promotion for progress. I think Jordan wants to jump oh. in. <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt you. Are, are you finished with your thought? Um, no, I was going to extend it, that um, patents are a failure in this sense. They are something that we have to do to get this progress that we want. But if we're getting the progress without the patent, then it doesn't seem like we want to encourage behaviors that will hinder that progress without patents. We would rather have well, progress that's, without that's, patents. I think that should be regarded as an open question because companies with market power can do that. In, uh, in, and crush little guys. 
um, and it's a significant uh, anti-competitive issue. The, one of the reasons we have the troll problem is that high-tech industries have lots of inventions in their in their multifunction uh, 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 machines. Um, they don't bother to look and see whether that's already been patented by somebody. So I calculated how much it would cost to do clearance on an iPhone. I, I understand that, exactly. But they don't want to do the cost. They don't want to. They, it's not a, they don't want to do it. There are not enough attorneys in the United States to do it, just time-wise. You can't. Fire an AI. Let me do it, George. So we, we have the this is, this is a, actually an honest, an honest question. Going back to the uh, involuntary uh, domestic industry question, right? So I was going to pick on something that the Keisha had, had said, uh, which we didn't really follow up on, which is that in that $20,000 settlement agreement between the uh, the PAE and the uh, and and the alleged infringer you could you could either try to structure it as just a, a release and covenant not to sue which could still be interpreted as a license possibly or you could have some sort of contractual covenant um, that you the licensee wouldn't um, wouldn't appear at the ITC. I'm I'm wondering how enforceable such a private covenant would be. I mean, if certainly in district court, you you can agree that you're not going to uh, respond to a subpoena issued by the court, but uh, good luck. Um, you're still going to be legally required to do it. And so I'm I'm wondering if there's been any any uh, discussion or, or or law on that, especially yet. What would how would you treat that kind of commitment by a company agreeing that it wouldn't agree to appear? Um, to show domestic industry. I want to be careful in the next week. I see a lot of agreements that are confidential. And I see people agree to things like Ms. Reynolds and you have talked about. And then I get requests to issue relief that appears contrary to these agreements. And I'm not interested in issuing relief contrary to uh, what private parties have agreed to, uh, because they have almost certainly fashioned a more efficient remedy to their dispute than I could come up with as an outsider. So I, I've seen things like this. Other judges have seen things like this, and we don't jump to get in the middle of it. Interesting. Thanks. Any, any closing thoughts? I know we're a little bit over time. No, all right. Well, um, thank you to our panel. Thank you to uh, Judge Hini and Professor Contreras uh, for a thoughtful and enlightening discussion.